Welcome back to the first of five lectures on the subject of cancer, human cancer specifically. And so far, most of the diseases we've covered have really been from outside invaders, whether this invasion was shock uh, caused by uh, trauma or organisms that live outside our body and somehow get inside the body. And uh, most of them were attributable to environmental factors. Now we're going to turn our attention to something we like to call the enemy within, which is cancer. And oddly enough, this is also a self-inflicted wound, which can be attributable in about 80% of cases to external environmental causes. And we'll see how this changes the cells in our body and turns them into our own enemy. Again, let me say something that I said in the first lecture because it's very important. Life on Earth evolved because of the susceptibility to mutation that's inherent in DNA. It's a fragile molecule. This is the way we pass on genetic information, and this is very easily damaged. If it were not easily damaged, there never would have been evolution. We'd still be back in the primordial soup. But because it's damageable, uh, we have been able to evolve, and also it's become a two-edged sword because our cells can evolve in a bad way, meaning cancer. It's that instability which is both the blessing and the curse of our DNA. I want to talk to you a little bit about the dark side of stem cells. Stem cells are very much in our news all the time now, and both from a scientific point of view and a political, ethical point of view. And so far, I've invoked everything uh, but mythology to explain the basic principles of some of the things we've talked about. So today, I'm going to go to mythology. Uh, Prometheus, the Titan, stole fire from the gods, and he gave it to humanity for its use. And he was punished by the, or Jupiter for his audacity. And Jupiter had him chained to a rock on the side of a mountain, where every day a vulture would come down and eat out his liver which sounds like that would ruin his whole day. And then the liver would regenerate, and the next day the torture would begin again. Now, I don't know whether the ancients knew that the liver was one of the only human organs that can regenerate itself, because had Jupiter sentenced Prometheus to have his heart eaten out, which is much more dramatic, uh, Prometheus would have died, because we don't regenerate our own hearts. And now we're on the threshold of stealing another power from the gods, the power to regenerate human organs and perpetuate life to a much greater length of time. Uh, there are some people who probably fear retribution from the gods again for this, but I know that we are going to do this. Somewhere on Earth, scientists, no matter what the political climate is, are going to learn how to use stem cells to regenerate organs. We're able to heal many injuries, and a lot of those we're never, uh, never aware of, because we're able to mobilize stem cells. These are the cells that, sh that come back into tissues that have been injured or actually been damaged beyond repair and replace those throughout our life. And the promise of stem cell research uh, of all kinds, lies in really one thing, and that is called pluripotentiality. Let me go through a little bit of what this means. If you look at the first slide, when we have the union of the sperm and the egg to produce one cell with a full complement of DNA, this divides into a very early form called the morula, which contains identical cells, all of which are totipotent. This means that, that any single cell in that little ball can then go on and divide and become virtually any cell in the human body, including embryonic tissue and placentas. Now, the big change comes when it divides and differentiates. If you look here, this means that these cells become different, they become more specialized, but they still retain something right here in these cells called pluripotency. And this means that it's the stem cell that has the potential to differentiate into any of the three germ layers of the body. Remember this slide? We had epithelium, which we call ectoderm, endothelium, we call 
endoderm, and then mesothelium, which is the middle layer of cells. And you remember the epithelium are things like skin on the outside and the lining of the intestine on the inside, and the mesoderm is muscle and bone or kidney. Now, the pluripotent cell could, especially at the embryologic level, back here, become any one of any organ cell, tissue, or system that it needs to become. The, it can't go back and produce certain specialized ones like the placenta, but that's really not important. So what we're interested in is what happens from here on. These are also cells that are able to start differentiating, meaning that they can start dividing and turning themselves into cells that are a little bit different than their predecessor and can start to specialize. And we, with each division that they go down, they lose a little bit of their power to become anything. So they go from pluripotentiality to what we call multipotent. They're starting to limit their choices as they move down the branches of the tree. And the multipotent hematopoietic cell, for example, the one that forms the blood elements, really can form a great many varied elements in the blood. When you think of all the different cells we looked at, they're quite different in structure and function, yet that progenitor cell, the precursor, could become almost anything. There's this ability to go through self-renewal. The uh, cell cycles can go through many, many divisions, maintaining the undifferentiated state. If you look at this slide, this is very schematic, but if you have this stem cell, usually an embryonic stem cell, it undergoes mitosis, it, it divides and creates equal chromosomes on each side, pinches off, and produces two daughter cells. What it does is just so wonderful and clever that I can hardly stand it. It keeps one of them exactly like the stem cell. So this one maintains the pool of stem cells from which to get new cells all throughout our life. And the other cell goes on to differentiate, going down different pathways to become anything except, as I said, a placenta or other of the early embryonic tissues. And finally, into what we call terminal differentiation. This doesn't mean terminal in the sense of deadly. It means it can't go back. It can never divide again and become less differentiated. This is the critical point when we talk about cancer and how it arises. We tend to use a number of terms that are not that well defined. The difference between totipotentiality and pluripotentiality is well defined because it has to do with the ability to make a placenta. Once we go beyond that, we talk about cells becoming multipotent and down the line they become committed and then they become determined and they just are getting more and more specialized. So the cell might join at a certain point the nervous system group and then it becomes more determined and it becomes maybe one of the neuronal cells or one of the supporting cells. And then it may become a brain cell or a spinal cord cell, which are not interchangeable. So it finally gets fully differentiated. This happens to all the cells when they reach terminal differentiated differentiation. And once they're there, fully differentiated cell, whether it be skin, muscle, intestinal lining or breast duct cells, which I'll talk a lot about because they're a good example. At that point, they have a very finite life expectancy. They can probably do 30 to 50 more divisions, depending on the kind of cell, and then they become senescent and they die. They can't do any more of that. And part of the reason is what I explained earlier on, I think, in the first lecture, about the loss of telomeres. The end of their chromosome becomes unraveled as they divide, and eventually this area shreds and the chromosome loses its integrity. What we're going to see is that cancer cells have a way of rebuilding this so they don't lose their integrity. We'll keep that in mind as we go along. But you need to know that when the cell is fully functioning, has totally kept 
all its properties and its ability for a pancreatic cell to make insulin, a breast cell to make secretions or milk, it loses its ability to reproduce. And there's no reversing that pathway. There's nothing we can do or anybody else to take that cell and reverse the pathway as far as we know so far. So they keep this daughter cell uh, in the mix to keep replenishing our stores, and that's going to be very important as we move along here. The different tissues have different rates of replication. We've already seen that in passing as we move along. And the thing about this whole system of differentiation is it's a double-edged sword. It really is a problem because it limits our lives. None of us really like that idea. It limits our ability to stay young forever. However, if all cells were immortal, and cancer cells are immortal, and we'll see why that happens, um, then all our cells would have a much greater potential to become cancer cells. So there's a balance, as there always is in nature. And nature has found this way to control the loss of replication ability in the fully differentiated cell in order to, uh, you really could say, save us from ourselves. I'm going to use some definitions, um, uh, some words in this course that need defining in the beginning. Uh, I do, usually don't do this, but I think it'd be good in this, in this lecture because we're going to be using these terms a lot. The first two are benign and malignant. Benign comes from the word bene, or good, or bringer of good, and malignant comes from mal, or malign, meaning bad or evil, bringer of death, the opposite of benign. When we talk about cancer, we're talking about malignant, but anything else is benign. And I'll explain when we get there how we make that definition. The other word used very loosely is tumor. You've already heard about it in rubor, dolor, calor, and tumor. And how the, the inflammation tumor is any mass. It is anything that occupies space. And when we're talking about tumors in, in this context, we're really not talking about anything but abnormal growths that could be a cancer, could be malignant, and they could be benign. We tend to use tumor when we're talking about cancer, but it's really a loose definition and we really shouldn't. Uh, cancers are not, I mean, tumors are not all cancerous. And um, again, we're gonna get to the definitions of how we know. Neoplasia is another similar word that's a little confusing. Neoplasm uh, is, a, is a singular growth. Uh, neoplasia is the process of making a neoplasm. It's literally any new growth. Neo means new and plasia means growth. And it's of any kind. It does not tell us whether it's benign or malignant. You really need to say benign neoplasm or malignant neoplasm, but again, in common medical talk, you will hear doctors almost always meaning um, that they're meaning a, a malignant neoplasm when they use the term, unless they specifically say not. And finally, the word anaplastic. Anaplastic means no characteristics, literally without form. And what we mean by this is if we go back and just in a schematic way look at this stem cell, we're really looking at something in which we cannot tell, even in the first few divisions, what pathway the cell is going to take. So it is without defining form. We have to go down this tree and see whether it looks like a gland or a muscle or a nerve cell. Anaplasia means without that defining form, and it signifies a very early, uh, a very early failure to differentiate and usually it goes along with a bad type of cancer. We'll set those aside, don't worry about them because now we're gonna come back and use them a lot. I think by the end of this, you'll know exactly where we are and what we're talking about. The first characteristic of cancer, in my definition, now if you go into a textbook, you're gonna see a slightly different definition, but I really think this definition works. I've been using it for a long time with a lot of different classes and uh, a lot of different levels of, of students from medical school to college, and it really works in your understanding of how and what makes a cancer cell. The first definition is the cell's failure to differentiate. We're talking about the stem cells now. When the cell, 
the stem cell moves in to try to replace the normal cell that's worn out. And there are stem cell niches in the body. For example, in the skin and hair follicles, we know that there are stem cells living down in this niche near the hair follicle, and they can move in to replace and differentiate. Remember, they start here as stem cells. But they are pretty much determined at this point to be epithelial cells. And as they move in to replace the epidermis, they will become terminally differentiated. In our colon or the intestine, we have stem cells down here which may replace any one of the kinds of cells in the mucosa. And for example, in the eye next to the cornea, we have stem cells that can move in and cover the eye in that transparent layer that covers the cornea uh, and covers the lens rather so that you can see. These cells are waiting. There's a storehouse of them that's supposed to last you your lifetime. And as they come into play, they differentiate normally. We used to think when I was in medical school that the fully matured cell, for example, a breast cell that secreted fluid or milk would lose its differentiation from something, we didn't know what, and revert and become less differentiated, poorly differentiated or anaplastic in becoming a cancer cell. That was called the histogenic assumption, meaning coming from the tissues. Histogenic means something born in the tissues, and it's totally false. It is still in textbooks. You still read a uh, text where a pathologist will talk about loss of differentiation. That doesn't happen. It's failure to differentiate, and it's a critically important part of this equation. You really have to know that this is failure to differentiate. If you take a normal breast, this is a section through the breast, it's made of fat and connective tissue, covered in skin, and it has lobules. These are cells that make secretions, and they also make milk during pregnancy. And these fluids flow out through the ducts of the, of the breast, ending up in about four to six on the nipple. And these ducts are lined with an epithelium that, that can make secretions of one kind or another during the non-pregnant state. If we cut one of those ducts across, what we will see is what looks like, now this is an apocrine cyst, but the breast is what we call an apocrine gland, meaning it loses some of its cells during its function. And this one it shows it very nicely, although it's not breast tissue that I'm showing you just yet. It has a nice single layer of cells, and on close-up of that one, you see how they're orderly. They have the same size nuclei. There's a basement membrane containing them. And these are normal breast duct cells that have evolved from those stem cells. They are determined breast cells that finally differentiate to replace them. When something happens partway along this pathway that stops the cell from becoming mature, that's the path to cancer. If we look at some real breast cells now, we can see that this is a section through a normal duct. Now, you're not seeing a single layer here because of a tangential cut, but the cells all pretty much look the same. It has an intact basement membrane surrounding it. And here's another area of cells in which they've started to replicate in a very serious manner. The edge looks pretty good. These cells are pretty well lined up, but look how it's filled the duct with cells. This is abnormal replication, not cancer yet, but abnormal replication. I want to show you some examples of the differentiation. Here's a cancer duct where things are starting to look bad. They have not replicated in a way yet to look differentiated. And look what's happened. We have cells of all different sizes and shapes. Some have dark nuclei, some have small nuclei. There are holes in the middle where there are no cells. And we call this pleomorphism, a variety of shapes. We then move along into the more serious 
uh, nature. Here we have a cancer of the breast. It does form some nice ducts, but we have cancer cells that are out in the tissue. It shouldn't be happening. And it's well differentiated because it's trying to make normal looking breast ducts. It's just not completely succeeding. We look at a poorly differentiated cancer and this one we really can hardly tell its breast at all. This is poorly differentiated cancer. This is failure of that stem cell to come even partway up the chain and starts replicating in a crazy manner with no differentiation as to how the shape should form. And then you can get into true anaplasia here. This is a skeletal muscle one, but it's totally bizarre. If I handed this to a pathologist and said, what tissue is this? He couldn't even tell me where it came from unless I told him where the biopsy came from. Normally, I could take tissue from any place in the body, say, here, and he'll say, that's breast, brain, colon. They'll know by the architecture, by the structure, by its face. But as you come back on the, on the levels of differentiation, it gets harder and harder to tell. Any pathologist worth his salt could tell you this was breast, but it was abnormal. They'd start having a problem here, and of course you get down into here, and then uh, in other ones like this, this is an invasive ductal cell, there's just no pattern. You can't tell. So criterion number one, failure to differentiate. And you can see where the stem cells are the players here. These are the ones that are important. The next one is called potential to invade. And the potential to invade is important in the next three parts of the definition. The potential part means to me that these are cancers before they've actually invaded into the tissue around them. They have all the mutations that are necessary, and we'll go into those in great detail, but for now, they have what's necessary for them to invade, but they haven't used it yet. All cancers start off in situ, in place, meaning they haven't broken through the basement membrane, they haven't gotten out into the tissues yet, coming back here. Neither of these pictures show you a breast duct where there's any cells outside of this basement membrane, this lining. So both of these are in situ. Now this is a normal duct, but this one could be what we call ductal carcinoma in situ. It could still be viewed as a cancer. We'd have to look more closely to see how, for example, how pleomorphic it is. This is probably a good example because it's pretty pleomorphic. I would have to say this is probably a cancer cell, but it's in situ. I'd have to pull back and look at all the surrounding areas to see whether I see any cancer cells outside. So that potential to invade is very important. If it doesn't have the potential to invade, it's not cancer, and they are still considered malignant because we know they can. We know from experience that somebody who has this can have as their next step cancer. The next one is the potential to metastasize. Metastasis means growth at another place. The plural is metastases, singular metastasis. The potential to metastasize is not the same as potential to invade. And it comes after, in time sequence, uh, invasion. You cannot metastasize, you cannot go to another place in the body unless you've already invaded the surrounding tissue and moved out of your confining anatomy. And that defines benign tumors. They are unable to get away from their normal anatomy. They cannot invade and they cannot metastasize. It makes sense if you think about it. The only way to move to another part of the body is to take a ride in the lymphatics, take a ride in the blood vessels, or to creep your way there by direct extension, which cancer cells can do, and we'll show you how. But until you've invaded out of your surrounding confines, uh, as I showed you there, you can't do it. So metastasis always follows invasion, but it doesn't have to occur 
until very late in the disease, it can occur very early. It's part of the biologic nature. The potential has to be there. Again, the genes that cause this disease are there in every cancer cell. Some cancers may take years to metastasize. For example, thyroid cancers in the neck can be there 20 years, grow slowly, invade slowly, and may never metastasize. There are breast cancers that are a few millimeters large, and they may metastasize very early. There's another thyroid cancer, a different kind, that metastasizes early, grows and strangles the patient around the windpipe within a few months. So there's a huge range of this ability to either metastasize or not. They go hand in hand. Most textbooks talk about invasion and metastasis as if they're one event. They're not. And there are different genes and different mutations that make them happen. I think it's very important to separate them. Here's an example of invasion in breast. This is a mammogram showing breast cancer. Cancer comes from the word for crab. And when you look at a cancer on an x-ray, and doctors saw this very early on, Here's the cancer. This is normal breast tissue. There's a lot of fat. There's some yellow streaking and white streaking that's kind of shiny. That's breast tissue. And here is the cancer. And you can see it's extending out into the surrounding tissue. And you can see on x-ray how it is pushing its way into the surrounding tissue like the claws of a crab. And that's how it got its name. Uh, when we talk about metastasis, here are what we call bloodborne metastasis. This is a section of a spine. This is the normal bone marrow of the spinal column, and these are the uh, intervertebral discs, but look at all the cancer growing in the bone, destroying the bone. Here's a slide of a section of brain with cancer growing in the brain, and this one is liver pockmarked with cancer all throughout. Here are the lungs almost completely replaced with metastatic cancer, cancer from somewhere else. And this is the adrenal gland. These are not to size, by the way, because these are tiny, uh, but the adrenal gland completely replaced with cancer, not something that's all that uncommon. And then finally, we go to the potential for lethality. Benign tumors only kill by accident. They can't metastasize. Most cancers start off in a place where they really can't kill you, like breast cancer. It's not a vital organ. The breast is not necessary to life so that the cancer can't kill you there. It has to metastasize to brain, to lung, to the bone marrow, to the liver before it can do its damage. The lethality becomes unleashed in the metastatic potential. Benign tumors can kill you, but that's by accident. That's like... Uh, you know, a few ounces of lead really isn't a, a threat to you unless it comes out of the barrel of a gun at a thousand feet per second. Then it becomes a threat by accident in a way. Benign tumors can grow inside the cranium, inside your skull. They can't metastasize, they can't invade, but they can grow and cause pressure. It's just the bad location that makes them kill you. There's a myxoma, which grows in the heart. Totally benign, can't spread. But it's flopping around in the heart, and as it gets big, it could plug a vessel. And if it plugged the aorta or the coronary vessels, you would die. Totally a mistake. It just is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Cancers are lethal by design. It is their nature to go to places that will kill you. A few of the other items that we want to talk about, they are immortal because they can replace themselves uh, and replace their telomeres continuously and stay young. There are cells from a woman who was called Helen Lane. She really isn't. They call her cells HeLa cells, Helen Lane. She was really Henrietta Lacks. They took her cells without her permission from her cervical cancer. And back in, uh, I think it was the 50s, early 50s, and her cells are alive today in tissue culture. They've always, if you give them the space, the nutrition, they will stay alive forever. They are autonomous. They don't listen to the signals from other cells. They listen to their own signals and they respond to those. Normal cells don't do this. 
They are unresponsive to breaking signals. So cancer is a genetic disease. It is a defect in the genes that gives them mutations or changes that in natural selection go on to make them more powerful and more aggressive and give them these characteristics which end in lethality. It's a microevolutionary process with survival of the fittest cell and really survival of the fittest gene in its most basic form. And we'll go on next time to see how these characteristics actually come to life through the molecular mechanisms in the cell.